session as well, so thank you for choosing this one. I hope it's um, yeah, it's going to be useful. Um, this is one. Oh, yeah. I'm going to talk about change. Um, big change, big 300 points positive change. Um, and on the one hand, I'm going to talk about changes in Drupal. Um, now we've got Drupal 8, I think we need to be talking about how that changes the community. Um, but also change in a more general sense, changes that I've been through, um, things that we can learn that I think um, can inform what we're doing, um, changes in technology, and um, you know, as Jan Lanyu says, that the most important thing about technology is, is how it changes us. So first, just to put this into perspective, um, you know, if you think about technology, it's not just about computers, like you can think about, you know, since we made the first tools, you know, that was the technology of the time. And John Maynard Smith gives us a thought experiment and says that if you imagine the whole of history in a, from the first vertebrates through to now in a two hour film, the tool making man, so technology, appears in the last minute of that film. And if you imagine a the history of tool making man, so like the, the story of technology. And if that was a two hour film, then the domestication of plants and animals that happened in the last half minute, and the printing press, the steam engine, the atomic bomb, the internet, all of that would happen in the last second. So really what that shows is that technology, you know, is is basically just exploding and we are live in a time of, of constant change that, like, basically, we've never had before. So, yeah, change. If I think about... Sorry, yeah, that. And if I think about change um, that, you know, just a change I've seen in my life, if I think about, you know, my first experiences on the internet um, in the mid-90s, I it was before we had dial-up at home, I used to get a couple of hours a week um, at a training centre in the local town, and so I used to you know, collect up as many floppy disks as I could find, uh, go down there and download lots of demos and more music mods and things. I don't know if everyone remembers these times, but you could get a lot of them for one megabyte floppy back then. Uh, very good. And then in 97, I built my first website that someone paid me to build, believably. Um, does everyone remember Frame Set? If you don't remember it, it was like basically Web Components or Angular 2, but in the 90s. Um, and then I went to university later that year, and they gave me some space, so I started building a website. But the internet was very different back then. There was no Google. You couldn't um, search for things and have them delivered to you. You would look through directories of websites, or there'd be like web rings that collected together websites around certain topics. But every site was unique and different. And you could tell you were accessing someone else's computer. It was like, you know, you'd gone around to someone's house and let you in to have a look around. Every every site was unique and um, really personalized by its creator, like like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> he has a website. Um, and so I think about what, like, my, you know, self back then, the first time I was using the internet, it's like what I think of the internet today. And I imagine myself like going back in time to try and explain to myself what we've done. Um, I'd have to explain how you know, we thought technology was going to be this uh, time-saving thing that you know, made us all smarter, but <laughs> actually it seemed like it was making us more dumb and actually we created loads more distractions so we're actually less productive. <coughs> I'd have to explain how the internet was supposed to bring us all closer together and actually in many ways isolated us. And I'd have to explain how instead of every person you know, creating a unique profile, we basically decided to sort of fit ourselves into the rigid templates that we put our personalities, our businesses into. I'd have to explain how we'd invented this word cloud to disguise the fact that we were using other people's computers to store all our personal information. And I'd have to explain how we'd 
basically become dependent on these uh, corporate silos that basically use hid behind this concept of cloud to collect data on every aspect of our lives and then use that data to manipulate what we see online to make billions of dollars. And this is one I find hard because I probably wouldn't have understood at the time if I went back and tried to explain to myself that basically one company would control retail online. Um, I'd be like, but what about this free open web that we've got? <laughs> I don't think I'd be able to understand that. Um, but I'd also be able to say that um, yeah, there, was, there were people who were working to make a independent alternative to the corporate web. And I'd have to say that you know, I was part of that. So that was, you know, there's another big change was with me coming from Sheffield and moving down to London. In Sheffield, I'd hidden away from the dot-com boom and bust in academia, doing research on semantics of object-oriented programming languages. But I, it was there that I first met Drupal. Uh, it was Drupal 4.3. Um, I used it to build a, a community site for a, for a group of DJs that I was part of, and I really didn't do anything more than just install it and forget about it, really. Um, I didn't realize there was this community growing that would collaborate to build something so amazing. Um, I learned about cooperation later um, when I moved to London, so I came down to London for... Um, I got a chance to head up the new media department at an independent record label. And at the time, iTunes was about to launch in the UK. And I was about to learn about cooperation. Um, and I was also going to learn how to do a startup. Because working in independent music, um, the digital music services were basically not playing fair. We, I, was, I joined the new media committee at the Association for Independent Music and together, collectively, the independent record labels could represent and get a fair deal from iTunes. So we could get the same for independent artists that major labels were getting. So I really, that's, you know, taught me that the power of independent collaborating. Um, and then I came back to, you know, I did a, that turned into a startup kind of accidentally. Um, it turned out what we built was a record label, other people wanted to use it, so we kind of accidentally did a startup. And then after that, I went freelance and found Drupal again. And again, found this community of independence all collaborating. So for me, it was a natural fit. I want to talk a bit about change outside of that because. When I first moved to London, I lived in Dalston, and going back there now, it's a completely different place. Um, yeah, as you can see, the, it's now a lot of posh flats, and it's mainly inhabited by ghosts. <laughs> <this picture. laughs> but um, I got more immediate experience of this, um, this process of change, this process of gentrification, when I lived in Brixton. I lived there for, for several years. So, it had already well on its way to gentrification when I moved there. It wasn't the 24-hour crack supermarket that it used to be. <laughs> but, um, you know, it still had its edgy bits and there were still areas you'd avoid. But the process of gentrification, you know, Brixton was a classic example of this. First, the, the artists and dropouts and mainstream society moved there. Um, and, I, you know, I lived between two squats of, like, basically artist communities, so... You know, I could see and witness this around me. <coughs> and the, um, basically, the, that starts to reduce the, the perceived risks. And then the, um, you know, the typical pattern then is that, you know, things like bistros start to pop up as, as the risks and the area starts to become you know, safer. It was, um, in the article I got this, this image is from a, a photo piece about Brixton gentrification and the author said that one day 
All that will be left will be the carefully packaged Brixton experience, and not the living culture and people who made the place unique in the first place. Um, and in another article, um, writer Brett Scott talks about gentrification and says that as the perceived dangers that keep the property developers away uh, erode, the exotic becomes safe, interesting, cool, and not threatening. And he says, like, um, a tiger being transformed into a zoo animal and a picture, and then a tiger print dress to wear at cocktail parties. Uh, something feels gentrified when this shallow aesthetic of a tiger takes over from the authentic lived experience of a tiger. So I really like that idea. Um, basically, both those quotes showing that it's the gentrification that retains the essence of the thing, but kind of loses what made it, you know, the, the quality that made it what it was. So I switched to thinking about Drupal and how that's changed over the years. Um, but to put it into context, like how Drupal came around in 2001, and you know, as the web was a very different place back then. You know, GeoCities was kind of past its peak. Um, MySpace had yet to arrive. Um, but yeah, <coughs> GeoCities, you know, that basically lost popularity. GeoCities basically, you know, you could get a profile on there, you had full, complete control to do whatever you wanted to it. Then GeoCities got replaced with things like LiveJournal, um, Friendster, which then became the sort of blogger and MySpace, and you see the options for customization and options for control reducing, and eventually we get to Facebook where we have you know, quite a rigid, defined template. But Drupal you know, persisted through all of these changes, everything that was changing on the, the web, and from message board to you know, hackable platform, and now to enterprise CMS. So you can think that like the original um, sort of artist that came and started to sort of pioneer the area with the, the political activists, um, like that launched the first Drupal company, Civic Spaces. Um, that led to NGOs, charities, um, and then that sort of makes the place accessible. Then the sort of media companies move in with the likes of MTV, and it starts to look interesting and cool and not happening. <coughs> and then we get the, you know, the White House and the enterprise clients. So. You know, there's obviously big changes, and we have to think about how that affects us as a community. At the same time, Drupal has gone through massive changes, and Drupal obviously built on PHP, so we have to take into account how PHP has changed. Um, you know, Rasmus talks about um, the beginnings of PHP and how no one uses it how it was supposed to be used. Um, it was uh, basically like a wrapper around some C that you could access from your web pages. But as no one wanted to write C code, more functionality was put into PHP. And it's actually, this was what actually what, you know, people can slide off PHP a little bit for, you know, some of the inconsistencies and things people complain about. But a lot of that comes from the fact that it was just wrapping C libraries, and different C libraries had different conventions, so those inconsistencies appeared in PHP. So if you look into like strings and arrays, in a particular context, PHP is consistent. <coughs> but then actually we, you know, through the years that Drupal um, innovated, because Drupal had to come up with concepts to do what it needed to do, because PHP didn't support a lot of the things like extensibility that, that PHP wanted, uh, that Drupal wanted. So we innovated things with using naming conventions to deal with like namespacing issues and modules and things like that. So you know a lot of those Drupalisms, the things that people complain about Drupal, <coughs> actually came about as innovations that meant that we could achieve what we wanted to achieve. And then we think about how that's changed now because you kind of have to forget everything you know about PHP and relearn it. The, the PHP world now is, is totally different. Um, PHP, you know, it's a proper language. It's a fast scripting language. 
PHP 7 in benchmarks outperforms pretty much everything else except Go for doing like webby related things. Um, faster than, you know, for most common web kind of things, faster than Node.js. So we really have to start taking PHP seriously. And also then we've got the ecosystem that's come up around it. And, you know, Drupal 8 is part of that, but it's only part of the, the whole ecosystem of Symfony that, you know, with all these libraries and stuff that's available through packages. So, it's, yeah, it's a great time to be doing PHP and Drupal. But, bearing in mind all of those changes, how has that changed Drupal, the user base and the community? How have we changed? Because we've, um, oh, what was it? Not that one. <laughs> Sorry, I just got distracted by those people in at the back. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we've we've come a long way from the the early days of activism, um, and you know. The, that means that, you know, over the time, the kind of things that, you know, we've, we've made gains from that. You know, if you think about the urban regeneration part that happens in gentrification, you know, you've got, you can look at the kind of topics that have been talked about at conferences over the years and kind of get an idea of how the community has developed with things like configuration management, better development workflows, testing, and better tooling. These are all things that we've developed and we all benefit from. But there's always going to be some people who see the other side of the gentrification process, what makes it controversial, and that's the, the sort of social cleansing aspect of it. Um, so, yeah, who who do we who loses out? Like, do the you know original grassroots users, uh, you know, if they're on like lower end hardware, they struggle with the, you know, hosting it themselves, there's Drupal as a service, you know, Drupal as a platform as a service offering, but, you know, they can be quite complex and pricey for those individual smaller organizations and grassroots organizations. So we find that they've kind of moved over to places like Squarespace where you can quite easily build your own website. That brings its own problems because you realize you've outgrown something like Squarespace, which, you know, it's not really a CMS, it's a page builder. Um, and you realize you've outgrown that when you, you know, when it's too late and you've got, you know, it's quite hard to manage. So I think it's important we, we think about how we support those users. Um, Thomas Hawke on my, on posted a link to QCAP theory of digital activism on my um, blog and you know he asked like how easy is it to build a site to share cat pictures in Drupal? <laughs> you know, the easier that is, the better we'll be able to bring grassroots back into the fold. Because <laughs> the idea is that, you know, people are more interested in looking at pictures of cats than activism. So activists and people campaigning and people making positive change in the world should use those platforms where people are rather than developing them themselves. So, you know, I think what I'm saying is that we you know we develop that platform and everyone benefits. So yeah, Brett Scott I mentioned earlier says, you know, do you abandon the form, leave it to the yuppies and head to the next wild frontier? Or do you attempt to break the cycle, deface the estate agent signs and pick it outside the wine bar? Or, you know, that's two options. There is another option and yeah, um, Buckminster Fuller, he says, you never change things by fighting the existing mm -hmm. reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So, you know, you think about Drupal, like, as the proceeds of Drupal's success, you know, come back into the community, we need to be using that to do good to support people, you know, making positive change in the world. And, you know, I want to be proud to be able to say, I do Drupal. 
And for me, that means you know I'm part of something that is a you know, community collaborating to build something that is a tool for, for people making positive change. But also, you know, as I talked about earlier, the, the changes in the web and the loss of that open web and the move towards the sort of corporate silos. Um, I think you know we need to think about Drupal as a as a tool to support and build that that open web and that independent alternative to the corporate web. Um, not that bit yet. <laughs> um, Chris Anderson says <coughs> the last ten years have been about discovering new social and innovation models on the web. Then the next ten years will be about applying them to the real world. Real real world. Um, so, this gives us another way to think about, you know, the changes. If, rather than seeing it as the, you know, enterprises coming to us, is this us going to them? Is this us taking our practices into those? And I think, you know, in the keynote this morning, there was talk of this idea of developer anarchy and enterprises adopting open source ways of thinking. So, you know, maybe, maybe we are turning it on its head, and maybe it's, you know, the Enterprises could get degentrified if that's even what I'm trying to explain. <laughs> um, so yeah, how I've got some ideas of what we what we can do, um, but before we, we we start to make things better, we we have to stop making things worse. Um, I have to apologise because I know in the past I've done some things that have made the internet worse. Um, but I've chosen now not to do that. Um, I'm, you know, never again will I let a video autoplay. Um, I'm not going to do another carousel. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to do any like, you know, social logging maybe, but you know, there has to be an alternative as well to using a you know, silo identity. Um, I made this point that you know it's you know us the developers that <coughs> that build this stuff that break the web. And you know, it's not just this. It's the um, you know, it's the things like you know, the modal, the pop-ups, the yeah, I mentioned the carousels, drop-down menus. You know, all of these horrible things that that break the experience on the open web. Um, and by doing, by reducing the, the experience on the web, we push people to the silos. So we need to make stop making the web worse. Is what I'm saying. And and we developers, if this is our thing, we are, we're building. It. Someone said to me, you know, you can't blame the developers, it's the, the ad ops people or the business people asking for this, but they're not going to build it. <coughs> you know, if the developers stop building it, then it doesn't exist. Um, we need to basically take responsibility. We need to stand up and say why these things are all a bad idea. We need to take responsibility and offer alternatives and come up with, with new solutions of achieving the same thing. You know, so we can... You know, all of these small little things might add up, um, basically. To yeah, so I, I came up with this idea of a, the retrograde grade clause. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but um, I'm going to try and squeeze this into my contract somehow. Um, if you can't read the small print, I'll read it for you. <laughs> it says that the the client will not force the developer to produce any developer uh, any feature that the developer believes degrades the experience of the web, interferes with expected browser functionality, or damages accessibility. Such features include, but are not limited to, modals, drop-down menus, carousels, auto-playing videos, intrusive advertising, multi-part articles, scroll hijacking, and welcome screens. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we know how to stop making the web worse. You know, we just have to stop doing this shit. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, how do we make it better? So, we need to look at the silos and the functionality that they have, and we need to replicate that, but better. And we need to, and we can do that within the Drupal community, within the wider web development community. We can look at features that they have. Um, and implement them in a more open and interoperable way. So, the backlink, for example, this is a feature that all the silos implement, 
if someone links to you, if someone mentions you, you get a notification. Uh, this is what makes the silo so sticky. Um, and we can have that now on the open web as well. This is a actual working draft thing. You know, it's a standard. You know, we can, we can start implementing this and start using it. And we can have that functionality, but in an interoperable way. Um, the other thing is the silos have this kind of omnipresence. And we can have that too in Micropub. So you can imagine being on your friend's website, looking at their photographs on their website and leaving a comment. That comment gets posted back to your website, so you host that comment. It's your comment. Um, so this, again, is another <coughs> um, working draft standard. But these, but these standards, um, they're not just people sat around talking about standards, wouldn't this be nice? This is, this is a movement. It's indie web. And it's happening. Um, there are services, there's a service like Bridgie, which allows you to easily use this. Um, it's gone from development leader stage, it's getting into journalist and blogger stage, because there's now a uh, really good WordPress module that supports this. Um, but, you know, there's a plan for, for how this spreads to the, to the wider open web. So, above all, it's about choice. Because we have a choice about what we build. We're building the web. We <coughs> value the open web as opposed to the closed off, you know, siloed web. Um, and we need choice because anything other than choice, you know, limits our options. Anything other than choice um, limits what we what we can do. Um, I don't want to have to install WhatsApp or Slack to be able to communicate with you. Now I want to use email, or, you know, it doesn't matter, we, we've all got a different system, but we talk to each other. I don't want to use Facebook, I don't want to follow you on Facebook to see what you're up to, I want to follow you on your website, where I can see your personality or your brand shine through. You know, but most of all, I, I love the web and I think it's got the power to change the world. I think we're seeing that happen, but not in the way that Silicon Valley sees it. Our future, I think, our independence, you know, democracy, depend on having choice and options. So we need the wild open web. So, yeah, we have a choice. Let's stop making it worse and start making it better. Thanks. Um, I'm thinking of doing a bot on web mention and micropod if people are interested in you know, how we can get that functionality on our site. So yeah. Any questions? Any opinions? Anyone disagree? <laughs>
because your glove will make them kind of same mistake. Yeah, so it's kind of a common mistake. Yeah, thank you. No, I agree, and I think actually, you know, you make a very good point about you know, opportunities for, for everyone, but you know, what we find is that in systems where everyone's you know, kind of put in and segmented quite easily, there, there's things like algor algorithmic cruelty, mm -hmm. where people get discriminated by algorithms. And so, yeah, I mean, this, this fully supports what you're saying. But, you know, further on what you're saying, I think about, you know, not making it work is one thing, and we, yeah, we do know how to do that, and, you know, we can at least have that intention, and this, you know, making it better, this is, you know, it's not something that everyone's going to fully adopt, there's a process for doing this, and we have to get those, you know, people who are, you know, the bloggers, journalists, they're going to benefit immediately from the, you know, these, these technologies, so that kind of got to get it out there. Just a, a thought, um, you, you're talking, I mean, I, I, I've been thinking along the not, think, not making it worse lines in another context, and that's in terms of um, road works and, you know, digging up roads and stuff. And my thought is that if we all aim at not making it worse, you know, whether it's people digging up roads or whatever else, Inevitably, we're human. We sometimes <coughs> don't quite get to the don't make it worse. So we all make it a little bit worse. So the trend is down. What we should be doing is to always aim, aim for making it a little better. Mm. So we're always saying, no, the, 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 the current state is the minimum, not the goal. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think this is what we need to talk about as a community. And I started off with talking about, you know, Drupal 8 changes things and our community is changing and where are our priorities. And, yeah, I think that, you know, there are important things like this happening and we can do those big projects, get those enterprise clients, but at the same time we can use that to keep, you know, supporting the, the grassroots and people, you know, making positive change in the world. So, yeah, more people that need webcam. trend is that complexity gets pushed down the stack mm. and we build more and more layers of abstraction so people don't <coughs> really think about what's going on underneath. Mm. Mm.
finishing of the community calling to the good Friday? I think the key thing we get is a um, is ownership and control initially. <coughs> so to think about that, um, and the idea that you know you're there to connect us, and you know there are technologies to to create those connections as well as the open web. We've, you know, we've had RSS for years, and there's no reason why you can't follow all of your phone sites if they were supporting RSS, for example. And there's you know, the similar use of Bitbond, things like Microsoft or worth mentioning. Those, these technologies can be used to, to create that sort of two-way link and that two-way interaction. And HubSub as well is, uh, HubSub is, a, is a way of getting, it's like RSS, but real-time. Just a, a reference is uh, something called darkpatterns.org, which is the um, same sort of thing you're talking about, but with uh, UX. So basically, the, the people out there that are doing really nasty, manipulative stuff through UX. And it's basically like a name and shame campaign. It's like, look at, look at what these guys are doing. And uh, <laughs> so I, just, I thought you might like that. So, uh, yeah, dark, darkpatterns.org is a good, uh, good resource. Yeah, partly that's done. I thought that's a celebrated good <laughs> but it's um, there's a there's a talk on there. It's like a, a conference, and he basically explains some of the things that he's seen, mm -hmm. and actually you know, hands up that he's done it, and that you know, he's been involved in these corporates that are sort of doing these things and shoving buttons where you can't see them and putting things in your basket that shouldn't be there and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he's basically running a campaign to say, you know, if we're going to build a better web, we've got to stop doing stuff like this because it's you know it's yeah. it's, it's, it's bad. <coughs> really, it's bad content. <coughs> and, you know, and, and I mentioned in the beginning of the talk about you know, the, if you know one single retailer basically owns the whole of commerce. Yeah. You know, if you create bad experiences all over the web, you're just pushing people to that yeah. single experience. And, yeah. It makes me think that that just like you know, architects of a of a, a, a civil you know um, building variety, we should have some sort of um, required registration of. of People saying that we will we will not do bad things. You know, we will not make buildings that fall down. We will not, you know, yeah. fail to put any any <coughs> windows in buildings or whatever it is. You know, we'll, we'll yeah. just the Hippocratic oath for winter. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't know what shape it would be. But <coughs> something. Like that. Yeah, I think I was thinking like the ACB has a kind of conflict between. <laughs> example, you know, it can be used for Bitcoin, but we see all of its dynamic, let's say, but it can be used also for many, like the idea of creating kind of social contracts in a distributed way. So, yeah. Um, thoughts on that? I mean, I don't really, you know, yeah, I guess it, it adds extra levels to the discussion. Um, for me at the moment, it's more of a philosophical Anyone here is you know, up for that?